everyone and welcome back to another episode of apollo's odyssey i'm your host apollo asteria and welcome back to another wednesday uh i'm really excited to bring on my guest for tonight mary edwards who has a really incredible background and uh we're going to talk about uh self-sustaining communities and the future of self-sustaining communities uh, i actually was on her show yesterday and we kind of went over all this, so I thought it'd be really interesting to bring her on to mine and kind of continue the conversation. Uh, so before I bring her on, I want to let you all know that I am super excited to announce that I finally finished my Shaman Spears collection, uh, the Ultraviolet collection, or my next collection, which is the Ultraviolet collection. I've been working on it for quite a while. I mean, literally almost a year. And I finished it just in time for the Conscious Life Expo, which will be coming up in L.A., uh, I believe, in a week from now. It starts on February 10th in L.A. Um, but if you want to check out this new collection, make sure you go to shamanspears.com and check that out. I'll go ahead and pull that up right now. Um, one second here. Um, so they are all up on shamanspears.com as you can see right now. And you guys, I'm very excited to announce that this is finally up because, oh my gosh, I've been working on it for so long. So, uh, it's, it's seriously been months and months and months of work. And this collection is really incredible because I wanted to make it look like how, um, basically insects see things, which is through ultraviolet, the ultraviolet light spectrum. So I kind of themed all the coloring from this collection off the ultraviolet light spectrum. So uh, very interesting and exciting. So I'm in, by the way, uh, basically all these spears are what helps fund me being able to travel to conferences and keep my show going. So any purchases of the spears are very much appreciated. Uh, the website is on the ticker at the bottom of the screen and uh yeah so please go check those out all right uh bringing up mary now mary how are you doing i'm great good to see you again in 24 hours what a treat <laughs> <laughs> yeah so great i i had a really good time discussing things on your show yesterday or i always have a great time talking to you because we really have so much in common with our interests and uh you know i really wanted to continue our conversation from yesterday about uh, self-sustaining communities and the future of that. Um, so before I, I guess we get into the conversation here, would you like to tell everyone a little of your background? And uh, I can pull up the PowerPoint you sent me if you'd like me to, or the yeah, PDF. Sure, sure whatever. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about the, if you want to do that now or in a little while, I'm happy to share my a little bit of my background with you. Um, I've had a, a blast for my whole life, actually. It's been a really interesting ride and journey since being a little girl and um, growing up outside Chicago and going on a craft with my father, which was very interesting at age five, and then again at six and at 10, and I've been going off planet, like many of us, for ever since then, till the other day. So... Um, I thought I was pretty normal until I started, you know, realizing all these different things, the way I felt, the way I saw things and felt things like many of us do. 
um, heard things, was hypersensitive to light and still am and people and all the senses and dimensions. Um, oh, there you go. Thank you. So, um, like Apollo here, I'm a multi-sensory, multi-dimensional girl and I've done, I do art. I got a BFA. I got an interior design degree. I went to a couple years of architecture school. I went to sustainability school here at Presidio, the Presidio Trust, um, Presidio Graduate School. And my passion has always been, it's always been a thread of healing and design and art from lifetimes, lifetimes as, as I can remember. And that little picture of me is a little, that picture of me as a little girl, that was at age five when I knew exactly what I wanted to be. I grew up with um, a rocket scientist father and grandfather and great grandfather. And my mom's dad was an architect and my mom and my grandmother were artists. So like Apollo here, we are very creative girls. And that um, my grandfather also had a lumber company. He had a design build company. And he, um, in the lumber company, they were selling wood to Frank Lloyd Wright and to different people way back, you know, in, their, in the 20s and 30s. And he was so mad about it, he actually standardized two by fours. So I grew up at that in my room and I was always, I, that was what, how I played. Um, when, after I went, I wrote at NASA when I was age nine, this letter says here, a 1960, you can imagine, I wrote NASA to be the first woman astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is incredible. So I have the proof of it. And it's if you can look at the logo, it's crazy. It's from that Joe's George Marshall Flight Center in Huntsville. And that logo isn't even the NASA logo. And oh, right. that's in Alabama, right? Yeah, that's in Alabama. And that's, you know, the Huntsville is still there. But and anyway, so I knew from an early childhood, there I am around the same age and wanting to do space and spaces. So I've said I've been creating happier, healthier environments for my whole life since really was since I was a little girl. So I grew up on job sites uh, with my grandfather and I saw rockets being built when I was a little girl, big ones. Yeah, so these were big companies and big, big locations. So I thought, well, I wanna do that too. So eventually I got to work for NASA. But it just, I always forget how little it was, how little I was when I started, like you did, you started young always knowing what I wanted to do. And I've just spent my life going step by step by step to really fulfilling my life and understanding what this crazy, wonderful, multidimensional life is with our um, sentient being friends and how to be expressive with our art and design as you are a master of that. And I've spent my life creating things from books to rugs in India to products at design firms on and off my whole life to um, anything that I can create to create spaces better, healthier, and more fun and spirited and colorful with natural materials makes me happy. I mean, my grandmother made that outfit. She and I designed that little outfit I had back on. She made all my clothes growing up. So I had spacesuits back then. I only wanted blues and blacks, which <laughs> black <laughs> dresses in the 60s was not really something people did. Um, oh, wow, really? Yeah. Oh, well, no, that was pretty weird. I mean, I was pretty weird. Wow. I was <laughs> That's all I wear is black, usually. <laughs> yeah. I try to like have a little bit of like color on it. But, you know, creativity starts young. And we if we are exposed to that, which I did through my homes, all the homes we had, I grew up in Lake Michigan, I fell in love with the water. And this was one of the first pieces of art, uh, let's see there, that I did. That's me in our, our backyard with my sisters. And this, and I did this disclosure art when um, COVID started, all my interior design projects shut down. Obviously you can't go into people's homes, whether it's in India or Africa or China or where, I mean, I was doing stuff all over the planet. So I started drawing and there's uh, area 51 where I found out recently my dad had been. And this is, mm -hmm. these are glimpses of my space travels. And then my heart, there's a spaceman coming out of my heart that was so- Oh, confused. I love that. <laughs> and then my heart was dragging. <laughs> But I love codes and I love numbers and I'm obsessed by, you know, I love 11 and threes and sixes and nines and and my heart was sort of broken, but I was always connected to space out here. There's a there's a spaceman. So anyway, as we creatives, many of us do, art is the inner expression of the beauty of the soul and with design and architecture, architecture link us to each other, our homes, lives and community 
with beautiful, powerful stories of love, loss, family, ancestry, culture, and history. So that's why we love being creative to ex allow portals for other people to dive into with whether it's art or your beautiful spears. Art <laughs> reminds us of all the different color and vitality and joy and beauty in life that there is around us in nature and in our home. So, um, sorry, I had to pull that back up. <laughs> no, that's okay. We're yeah. done with that. But that, um, it was a very creative life and it was great to be able to travel and work all over the planet and work at NASA for many years doing space station interiors with part of a team and, um, and doing projects all over the planet. So it's all about creating happy, calm, beautiful spaces or whatever kind of spaces people want. And also for the future. My dad was a head of research and development at his big aeronautical company. Um, so I grew up at the dining room table talking about design, build, you know, reentry systems. He designed most of the reentry rockets and parachutes and sent the monkeys up who basically most of them died by the time they got back. So I, that always really upset me as a child. So I was always hoping that when I worked at NASA doing the International Space Station in years, we could create more, you know, culturally artistic and earth ground orientation up so they weren't scared up there. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I actually haven't seen the inside of the International Space Station. You said you designed the interior well, of that. I, what is that? Um, well, that's in the, one of the slides in there. Um, that was years ago, too. Now there are much more. Um, they have many more. Um, obviously, they're always it's always about experiments. But the inside is, I can show you a quick picture of what it looks like on the inside. There's really not much to show. I didn't, I had a flood here a few years ago and it really destroyed almost everything that I had. Um, like it sort of did destroy everything I had, except for some of the things that I had on disk that didn't get wrecked. So let me take a look here and see if I can find it. Oh, um, no, I was just able to pull this back up too. Oh, oh okay. Thanks. Ah, okay. Here we go. Um, you know, it's obviously very tight quarters. It's like designing a floating um, mobile home park where you can't leave. And the astronauts had never done a Johnson Space Center where we um, designed it. Oh, I think it's back, back more in the oh. front. Um, but we were really trying to, there, that's it. That's oh. back, back one more. There. So it's oh, really wow. hard to see, but they're, they were, they're still, they're, they were very small. And our mission was, I say here, was to distress, de-stress astronauts and create a multi-sensory interior that was functional, cross-cultural and personal. And of course we had to come up think and test and discuss all the physical, psychological, you know, human factors of workload, supplies, food. And back then, you know, until recently, they weren't eating real food. I mean, they were eating out of tubes back then. And I was suggesting we, our, our team, we had about 24 people on the team. It was Dr. Von Clearwater who hired me as a contractor. And we did earth ground orientation. We were really trying to create a space that made them feel more like being at home. Because when you float around, you know, in zero gravity, which nobody had really thought about humans working in zero gravity back then, um, we were trying to create it, you know, symbols because we had a Japanese, you know, the ESA, European Space Agency, and they actually let me, we put in some um, trees um, in the, where they have to work out hour and a half or two hours a day because of all the, the way their body and bones shrink to the three inches in, in zero gravity over time. Wow. And just do some color coding. And we did testing in Antarctica in, because there are anything over 31 days is considered long-term duration flight. And this is, this was the first habitability and human factors department out of all the NASA's. And so we were really watched like a hawk of how we handled it. And I said, well, let's do a book, a big fat book of different materials. And um, I got to design the sleep restraints. They'd never thought of anybody actually being attached to a wall, like a sleeping bag because they were usually just floating around with a piece of Velcro, like floating around in the air, choking on that when they were eating their disgusting tube of food. Wow. <laughs> so we were we created foot restraints. So when they sat down, they were actually grounded because the zero gravity would have them floating around like that. So they could actually work. So it was all about 
talk about sustainable interiors. Every inch mattered, of course. And then we got, I said, let's do some studies in other long-term, uh, other long isolation and confinement like it, outposts in Antarctica, in Alaska, where people were living in really isolated and, and uh, confined environments. Um, so NASA bought about 500 of my photographs because I've always done, done a lot of photography. And I knew it was going to be like the Ham's Brewery picture, you know, uh, nature with just some music going on in the background. So we studied, we did a lot of tests back and forth of what kind of art they like to look at, like look at. And we went on, we did this for about a year and a half and it came back that they wanted to look at nature of diff, not necessarily just of their culture, but of green trees, water, no buildings because they were isolated, confined in this little, basically like shoebox, right? Right. <laughs> and um, all nature based, and they just wanted water and some with just some distance, not like a tidal wave of water. So we we sent fifty different kinds of water. Do they want to be far enough away from that? Do you want a waterfall, or do you think you're going to be drowning in it? So of course, in a small scale, it was all about scale and proportion. So anyway, that was really interesting. And then they let me. I suggested we build a full size mock up down at Johnson Space Center and they did, they let us test pupillary dilation and heartbeat and a lot of these um, different psychophysical and psychological testing that we did in three or four outfits of interiors to just double check that people, it, people and astronauts and then other workers, we tested a few thousand people and the astronauts that we tested and the people that were going through these and that would live in these things for a week or two said, oh, wow, wow, what a difference that made to have some color, to have earth ground orientation. So they felt a little more homelike and have some color code and have the, this movable art on the walls that they could turn on and off um, that had never been done before. What do you people. mean movable art? Well, it was just like art galleries of light, light flashes of, of different um, spaces of the photographs. We did them just um, putting them on the wall, like um, they had a variety of like art gallery um, that was flashed up on the wall because your only personal space was about one square foot. You were basically allowed to take a book, a couple of photos from home because they didn't, you know, they don't really have the crew quarters or teeny and you're sort of attached to the wall. So the art was just on different walls. You can't see all the walls, but like in the exercise room and somewhere, sometimes on the ceilings, I said, let maybe we can put some stars. Of course, they're looking outside at stars, but we, they, <laughs> and, I, and I don't know what they're using anymore, if they're even using any of them, but they love that to have a variety to change the environment. You go, it goes from day till night, every hour and a half. So it goes oh, from wow. day That's and then night. And I said, you know, we don't, we don't call them window treatments or they would have laughed at me, you know. But I said, you know, we've got to be able to block them out because they're so sleep deprived from stress. And then from this, think of your, you know, if, if the, you know, our sun came up every hour and a half. I mean, you go to sleep, then you wake up and they, they were so sleep deprived. And we did a lot of testing on circadian rhythm. We had one person that was totally focused on that. And also women with their periods and different things. We were curious about how women up there would be affected with their bodily functions, how men would. We designed. Wow, I've never thought that about that fabric. before. And I, I got to do all the testing. We did this testing of like 50,000 double rubs. I mean, I'd worked on hotels. I'd worked on restaurants. I'd worked on commercial spaces in Aspen and Bale and, you know, and, um, beauty shops and, you know, a lot of commercial spaces where we had to use really really deep, you know, really intense synthetics that you obviously need. And I worked on hospitals too. So we tried to pick, I mean, we did, we had to do like 50,000 double rubs. I mean, this fabric that we used, I mean, not only on the, the curtains for their little bathroom areas that they could pull across so they could have some privacy um, to their sleep restraints. Um, well, their sleeping bags, basically, but we call them sleep restraints were um, out of, you know, a bunch of synthetics. And I was picky about the colors and who the, we, we did a lot of research on the different colors. And I'd worked on some jails and, you know, in jails, people, warm colors recede, cool colors come at you. So, of course, when you start really look, evaluating colors and intensity of lights and the light, you know, you don't get really 
really controlled lights up there. We don't have task, they didn't have task lighting. So the lights were either on or off really. And this day to night and the circadian rhythm gets so screwed up in one month, two months, five months, six months, a year that the sleep, was, the sleep like people are stressed out now and no, half our world is not sleeping at night <laughs> because of stress. So up there, we were trying to really ground them with darker colored flooring, as you can see here, lighter color ceilings, and then delineate some of the spaces. So they felt like they had a sense of privacy and, and some color for some fun and green that meant nature and blue that was sky like on that, that wall we picked the blue for that. So there wasn't a lot that we really could do other than um, tr you know, test out in this full size mock-up that they built for us down at Johnson Space Center. And it was really fun hearing people's responses. And we'd go out for beers afterwards where my dad used to go and all the astronauts used to go down in, uh, in, down in Texas. And they'd wow. come up and say, oh my God, Mary and Yvonne, we were of course the only women there. I'd get up and speak for two or three hours. Yvonne would get up and talk for four or five. She was double PhD. They had gotten her, pulled her from Bechtel. She's just in, one of the most brilliant women I've ever worked with. And we got along famously because I was sort of the design person. She was the tech person. So we worked really well, but she, and she trusted me because I told her that I had grown up with space and secret space that I wouldn't ever talk about it. And I was teaching it at the Academy of our college. I was teaching art and design to, to, to college students at the time, which was a mandatory requirement for working as a contractor at NASA. I used to take oh, all really? the students down there for all those years I worked there. So they all got to work on the space station too, which was really fun for them to work on something. So anyway, it was, it was really learned a lot about color and design and of course the effects of it. A lot of us live in small spaces. I, I do now. So, I mean, I've always been sensitive to that. Well, I, I think uh, I'm actually interested to know how um, it, it does affect women being up there uh, women's rhythms. And I think that's really incredible that you were able to work on this project. I well, mean, it was, and people were more interested. Um, the, somebody, one of, and one of the times we were getting, um, it was Newsweek or Time Magazine or something back then. It, people, somebody said, what about sex in space? And <laughs> I, you know, I looked at Yvonne, like you're handling that. I mean, she was, <laughs> and I said, oh my God. So that came out and that went just talk about flash all over the place um, because people were concerned in zero gravity. What can you do? So it was, we talked to the women, you know, some of the women were concerned about how the hygiene and everything would go up there. Also eating is difficult. You can't go to the, you know, it's not natural rhythms <laughs> to go to the bathroom and different things. And also it's not that private. So all those things were really important issues to discuss it. And since we were the only women there, we were really, um, and Yvonne was in charge and we had all well, an ar two other architects and some psychologists and Richard Haynes, who's done a lot of books on um, back then was writing books and some of the first books on UFOs. And, yeah. you know, so there were a lot of really, um, I mean, brilliant people um, that were, were you. Oh, sorry. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, were you actually able to go up up there like in space to see it? No, not at all. But we had um, there. They had a lot of um, uh, little mock-ups down at Johnson Space Center that you could go into. They had like a wind tunnel, like they have at NASA here. My daughter worked at um, NASA too. Lizzie, who's oh, wow. thirty-two now, she worked at NASA for a few years. She's a tech wizard. She did international relations and media and communications. And when she got out of Tufts, um, she she worked for Avon also for three years, which she loved. And she, they, by then they had of many other things here at Moffett Field. That's about an hour away from here. Silicon Valley is right near me here in San Francisco. Um, right. So we got to go into whatever they had. Um, and if I was, I was with Avant. We went everywhere. I mean, we were in Europe. We were talking to ISA. We, um, we went to Brighton, England, with our whole team to for our final project. And I was six months pregnant, and I said to my doctor at the time and my former husband, 
I said, what could happen? I mean, what are we going to have a tornado or a hurricane at that time? Well, it was the Brighton, 1988 was a, the Brighton hurricane in Brighton, England. I barely got out of there and I went into preterm labor when I got out. Oh my got gosh, wow. And on the plane. So I, I mean, talk about stressed out. I mean, I saw it. If, if I had not a lot of acupuncture, he would have, my son who's 34 now would have come out a lot earlier. But um, it was, it was incredible to just be down in that environment. And since I grew up with, my dad, who was obviously, it was mostly a lot of top secret stuff. Um, but what I'd like to do is just read, I found an article on him. Just, I'd like to just explain just a little bit about what dad did, which I just found yeah. out um, what his company was devoted to. Um, he had a company that was Cook Electric Company and Labs. And I just found an article a few months ago that talked about and I'm, it's just a paragraph. I'll just read it to you. Is but the company still around now? Or no, is it was sold in the late 90s. Um, and he is up in heaven now. And I've talked to him a lot of times. I talked to him yesterday. And he's still up working. He, st he said he still talks to a lot of his, some of his Pleiadian and Arcturian friends. He talks to the government. He still gets contacted. He's seen Einstein up there, who he was with. Uh, Albert Einstein had, had drinks. I mean... You know, in heaven, it's it's another. He saw Werner von Braun, and he was talking about when he met Eisenhower a few times, telling me about that a few days ago, how in some private home, um, and how he met Bucky Fuller a couple of times, who's my idol. And I said, "What was that like?" And he said, "Just unbelievable." He said it was just un incredible. So you know, he was he was told to keep his mouth trap shut for seventy years, so he could never talk to me about anything. But I just found this article that was from 1956 on what his companies were. So I'll just say this. And he said, it's okay if I talk about this. But he said, uh, Bob Edwards ran Cook Electric Research Laboratories, one of seven divisions of the Cook Electric Company, devoted entirely to research and development in electronics, radar, nuclear physics, servo mechanisms, upper air research, weather reconnaissance, sonar, celestial and inertial navigation systems, aerodynamics, allied and allied fields. Cook had massive 30 to 40, 30,000 to 140,000 square foot buildings near military bases in Chicago, um, Skokie, Illinois, near where we grew up, Morton Grove, Illinois, and then Vandalia, Ohio. And I, when I read this a couple of months ago, I went, duh, that's Roy Patterson. And I looked up what the address was. I saw this when I was doing research, I was looking at my dad's company and this was on Etsy, this popped up. It was $3.99, they said the last one. His slide rule that he used to have in, he was like rocket scientist glasses like this, my whole childhood. And this was on Etsy because it was a pretty big deal company. But look, and wow. then listed all his companies. I never knew there was more than one company. I was only no way. one one company, and I was frisked when I was like five or six years old. I mean, these companies were like the size of city blocks. These were rockets and testing. They were down doing in, in you know, Werner von Braun. He and Werner von Braun were at 1951. At, at, I'm just finding all this out now from him since he passed. He said, I, I can talk about whatever I want to now. He said, I'm just glad you're be, you're able to share in this generation. So he said, I'm sorry, I, I had to lie to you forever I, about going up on a craft and all the work that I did. I mean, he, we, I, we knew he was a rocket scientist. We knew he was gone half the year, every year working. He was traveling all over the world. But so did everybody else in my family. So, I mean, but anyway, and this had all the... This has all the, had all the companies. And I, when I saw this like a month ago on Etsy, it was like, Cook Electric Labs, Vandalia. And I just watched something on Wright Patterson that, you know, Area 51 wasn't there in 1947. So it was like dad's company, the 140,000 square foot one they were building in 1958. <laughs> so that, and that was right next to Wright Patterson. So I'm, anyway, I've been connecting the dots a lot this year, but, um, and there was only one <laughs> and I got it. Isn't that crazy? Wow. That's, I mean, a, that's amazing. That. You said you found that on Etsy? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you meant to have it. <laughs> pretty crazy. So um, 
he loved rockets and he still does. He says he's up there helping people on earth, really, you know, smart kids and smart you know, individuals. And they still ask questions about everything. But I know you want to talk about SpaceX and move on to space of the future probably right now. So. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we should move forward with that. But yeah, your, your background is just so incredible. I mean, you know, probably out of anyone I've had on my show, I mean, you, <laughs> it's really amazing to hear what you have going on. Well, it, it's oh. really interesting now. Um, and it, I be, and because I was never allowed, he, dad was never allowed to talk about anything um, that, that, you know, I just talk, started talking to him three or four months ago for the first time in my life. And, and I said, did you go off planet? He said, yeah, I've been going off planet since I was seven. And I went, oh my God, I knew not, none of this till a few months ago. So it's been really cool to know that we've, you know, he said I got his wiring and psychism and hard work ethic and love of um, country and love. Of, he was a Navy pilot in the war, World War II. Um, and then he was working, of course, for the government and um, NASA and stuff. So he was very loyal and kept your trap shut. So, I mean, it was growing up for 70 years with the disclosure. So I am like Miss Disclosure. And now I am. Exactly. He's saying, Mary speak, talk, say whatever you want. Um, he said, because I, w I was sworn to secrecy. So it was really awful thinking I was crazy my whole life. So anyway, I was on the right path. And now I, I got validated by my father in that. That's really, and, and now you're here to present all this information to everyone, which is really great. And, you know, I, I love, um, you know, what you've said about how you like to connect inner and outer space. And, you know, I, I was curious on what your thoughts were on the future of uh, sustainable homes. You know, yesterday we kind of went through on your show, these different kinds of sustainable homes and, you know, I can pull those up, but I didn't know what you had planned to talk about in regards to sustainable homes on possibly other planets or, you know, um, in the future or uh, space habitats that have uh, sustainable living spaces within them. Um, where would you like to move forward with this? Well, I think since, you know, I haven't, I've done 30,000 acre hotel in, in China and development. I've done developments. I did a $30 million bill in Italy on 50 acres. I mean, I've done a lot of stuff here. When I went to architecture school, what, 25 years ago, I was designing, you know, circular buildings that rotated with the sun. And I always wanted to bring out, you know, have nature, have sustainable materials, have it in, you know, near water and have a lot of natural light and natural materials as much as possible. I did a big um, net zero home uh, for some clients, took us a few years and we had, you know, solar panels. We tore the whole house down and renovated it. And it was like a $25 million house. I mean, it's expensive to do that. So I've put, I've worked on uh, 30 or 40 solar homes. I've worked on, I've never done any prefab, but I've been obsessed by free pap, prefab and, you know, tiny homes, any kind of housing that is small and su sustainable and practical. I've done um, like that little development I told you about. I used all natural materials. And I bought and flipped 50 houses on my own to support my kids. I was a single parent really for a long time. And I, I, I like simple, clean design and people evidently liked it. So every time I bought a house, a tired recycled house basically, and I did probably a thousand, eight hundred other houses for other people, ran a, a ground wow, that's stations. A lot of work. And then I worked at design firms and, and the firms like when I started working at when I was in college getting my BFA or right after I and I was going to interior design school at night. I forgot. Um they we were doing it on Nathaniel Hall and Madison Square Garden. They were designing the Star Trek logo. We were doing we lived in Boulder. Um and and I bought so I've done, bought eight or nine homes in Boulder, three condos, and flip them. And then I tear out the old, um, the old wood, and I put in good wood, like bamboo or natural wood. And I get all the lead-based paint that here in California, and, you know, in the '60s, a lot of the cancer is from all the toxic materials we know and the electromagnetic stuff that we've been living near our whole lives, which I have been hypersensitive to since I took feng shui classes 
30, 40 years ago. And I was spending a lot of time in China. I had my rug business 40 years ago in India for eight years and in Hong Kong and in Manila. So I was traveling there all the time because we didn't have cell phones or these computers <laughs> like now I'd have to do press checks. So I was always talking to acupuncturists. I was going, I was going to um, back trips with my Indian people. I was staying in their houses out in the middle of nowhere when they were weaving my flat weave woven rugs. Wow. Uh, and, um, and then my, my, he, that was the largest producer of durries in the world at the time. And he had 60,000 Indians ages like 14 all the way up. And I, I said, I'm, if I do rugs here, Ralph Lauren and I were the first ones to do rugs out of there a long time ago. And I said, I, I refuse to have anybody under 18. I want all natural, natural materials. So it took me about eight, an extra eight months or a year to get all natural silk, wool, cotton. And I was doing all silk and wool and cotton blends with all natural dyes. And I had them in 75 showrooms around the country and in about 25 retail stores. And this was 40 years ago. I mean, I was flying out. I was flying to Bombay. I was flying up these little places all by myself, sleeping on these like with hogs and chickens, and stuff, oh, wow. taking pictures and then taking all these black and white pictures back to all the showrooms and saying, you know, this is a silk rug and a silkworm line, you know, line is two miles long of a weave, you know, of the, of the natural fiber. So I was, yeah. I was doing these huge, really presentations to the, to teach them about sustainable products, rugs for your home. And I did a bunch of fabrics and stuff for him too, and products and tables and chairs and did a bunch of products for Paramount Pictures with like Woody Woodpecker and stuff over the years. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've done, well, you know, I've done tons of products. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of the products in here were wrecked during my flood. And I had another flood about 15 years ago that wrecked everything else that I had. But I, I've always loved natural materials because I grew up with that with my grandfather saying, do not be careful with the environment. These trees, by the time you're older, Mary, which I am now, I mean, I still feel like I'm 20. Um, but he, you know, he just said they'll all be gone. Half our trees of our planet will be gone. So he went around, he actually started Architectural Woodworkers Institute that had thousands of locations all over the world. And that little house I was in earlier in the talk here, <laughs> he used to take that. That that was a picture that I was on the cover of the Chicago Tribune. And oh, they were wow. taking pictures of us with this little house. He used all different kinds of wood in that house. And he would take that into schools and show them about some of the different kinds of wood and also just tell people these are, you know, be careful, you know, standardizing two by fours. They used to just buy wood in all reg in regular lengths. And he was one that said, no, we should sell them in sizes so you don't make waste all over the world. And then he went and taught people, contractors and this architectural woodworkers institute. Nobody had ever started that before. So I come from a long line of creatives who were also engineers who wanted to make the planet a better place. And that also gave a lot to the community. So I grew up with community spirit and that my other, my dad's father, that was the rocket scientist started the first um, underprivileged I mean, camp for kids in 1929. It was a YMCA camp for boys. Um, and it was sort of near a fancier place where we went. And then he donated a couple hundred acres and lakes and built the cabins. And all my cousins, we all, everybody still helps support it. So people from the south side of Chicago or places where they didn't have any grass or couldn't make a schmore at a, around a campfire, couldn't go to sleep and hear birds at night or see the stars shooting at night, that they had opportunities too. And Camp Edwards wow, is, so incredible. is still there. And they do you know, week long freebies for families who need to come and, and who want to come and are able to come and experience nature in the Wisconsin area and fish and camp and um, barbecue outdoors and, and really learn about some of the beach. And it's, it's really, they have a whole sustainability piece of it um, that they teach people, kids and the families about it too. They have for a long time. Oh, so, so they would like teach like on the property, how to property. Yes. They would talk. Yeah. I mean, not just like not a class class, but they would do, they talk about wood and about lumber and about the water and clean air and, you know, just wove it in. All my kids went to Montessori school. I always had them go to schools where they were learning about nature and have to, taking yoga and 
getting in touch with our mind, bodies, and spirits um, here in California. It was a lot easier to do that than a lot of places in this country. Um, so anyway, it was always about sustainable products. So I, um, I would, I would, I want to work on off planet. I've been going off planet my whole life. I can't remember because I was part of a lot of programs and have very little memory left. Um, I have memory of a lot of things, but I have a memory of not a lot of things. And a lot of it is some of the off planet um, things that came from my heritage and my ancestry that I'm still trying to delete and let go of. And then some of it, I don't probably need to remember. Um, so the what is this uh, Palladian tower sketch? Well, you um, said you've, I, you've worked I, on projects. Well, I, I've, done, I've been off planet about 125 times. And again, you can believe me or not. I tell the truth. I have little glimpses of some of these things. Um, I have talked to three or four different people, um, readers and, um, um, you know, psychic people who say, I say, do you see me go up there? <laughs> because I have these dreams and all my art on my walls here is, uh, is all these memories of, of me going to places, mile long crystal tunnels under the ground. And a lot of them are sort yeah. of some of these things. So anyway, I designed the Palladians take me and, um, I go up and I've been, I worked on this for about two or three years, three years. It's a 2 million square foot. And that's just a little sketch that I did. And um, they, you know, they, I go on, on site and I meet with them. And this is a particular building that was, it's a 2 million square foot, about a thousand feet tall. And I, um, and I have several people that I can't see because I had a lot of um, serious, uh, brain work done uh, that a lot of help from my um, sentient beings since childhood to help me advance my brain and with stats and math and science and different things. So I could do some of these things. They've been watching me like and helping me like they have you and my father and my grandfather all the way back. Um, but it also, I, I'm not able to see some of these things. So I have not seen this, but three or four people that I've been talking to for the last three years, since I dove into this, and finally into my beautiful world that I am uh, under trying to understand this and learn more about me and my life and how wiggly and weird it was when you can remember half of it and not most of it from yeah. treatments. So anyway, this, I, they see me up there. I'm talking to um, different beings. There are usually other, a couple other humans like me crew on, on the sites, whether it's in the Pleiades or in the middle of, in, in the subhabitats of any of the solar system. I've been to all of those. Um, and people see it crystal clear. They see me with my iPad and I'm sketching things out and they like me because of my DNA, because of my training, because I'm not judgmental, because I work hard. I went the other night and I just go and I can tell when I've been gone for, you know, like a few hours of um, human time. But um so I designed this and um, Dave and a few other people I work with said, oh, you got it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful white building of your clean, simple design. And um, I put trees on the top, gardens on top. And, and so I've been to all these places and they, my galactic family keeps saying, Mary, you may never get that memory back because it got sort of fried as a child because of some of the programs I wasn't, I'm not supposed to be like sharing some of it, dad and other people, they've said that it's okay for me to talk about these things. But so anyway, I've been right. doing uh, off planet work for 33 years, evidently, which is pretty mm -hmm. crazy. So, really? And they really protect me. And I say, you know, now, you know, my daughter's about to get married and have a child. I don't want to like have my, you know, from radioactive stuff. And they said, no, that I'm really protected, which I believe. I feel great. I've always been really healthy. I work out and I have a great attitude. Um, so anyway, I've, I've, a lot of, the, a lot of these places are for uh, the, they're carving out different habitats inside each of the planets of the solar system. Then I've done some work on other asteroids. So um, I've said this to a few people and if you don't, people don't have to believe me or not, but I, um, I've already been working on off-planet work for a long time and they picked me and they've been guiding me and teaching me and nurturing me. And um, I mean, I remember some of the craft that I was on at, at six and then at 10, they were putting information in 
then I remember other stuff going on, but and they, do they feel that you have some skills that like, you know, they don't have with, you know, whatever, like the beings that are on their planet yes. and that's why my, they bring you. Yeah. And like an Andromedan was here a few weeks ago. I heard somebody pound, like knocking on the door, which is really crazy. I called Dave, my friend that lives nearby. And I called him. I said, I said, I, somebody knocked on my door. I live in a condo building. My door is locked at night. Like it's a little thousand square foot condo. I got up out of bed. I thought, oh my God, somebody's, and I happen to have a doorman that's right out like 50 feet that way for this building. And so I got out of bed and I, and then I heard the door open and then I heard the door close. Um, and I've, I've felt, I've seen other little thing, little um, images and things in here, but I saw a big fuzzy thing. So anyway, a, a big sort of um, being over in the corner, I called Dave the next day and I said, oh, I think I, I had somebody here. Could you see? And he said, oh, that was an Andromeda and the, Pla the Palladians. He, they liked the, um, he, they wanted to come see what you did because the Palladians and Arcturians have been um, enjoying you for so long and have been, they love the way my psychism, the way I like to work with the beings. I'm not judgmental. I've got a good taste, they think. Uh, they they wanted to, and so I said to Dave, what was he doing here? And I said, can you bring him in? And he said, yeah, he's right here. And I said, oh, thanks for coming by next time. <laughs> Wake me up. But anyway, I said, what were you doing? He said, oh, I really like your white walls. <laughs> I like your art. I was just coming to check out because, um, and then he said, I love how it's inside and outside. It's very clean. There's not a lot of clutter here, which there is, and I don't like clutter. And so it was really interesting hearing him say that, him or what, um, and I've been told by, by my beings, I hear a lot. I, can, I have some telepathy in that. They just say because of my um, unusual ancestry that goes back to like zero AD um, and my training, my love of it, my DNA. They've been watching my family for a long time. I'm sure they watch a lot of people. I, I knew I was watched my whole childhood. I felt like people were looking around. I remember Madden and Black in my house. I remember always being watched. It was sort of a not a very relaxed <laughs> lifestyle because it was pretty fancy and we were watched a lot and Senator Percy lived next door. And so there were, we met presidents and ambassadors. I mean, it was always like, what is going on here? All I want to do is go to the beach and swim and paint rocks and not be social. <laughs> I mean, I'm a hermit. I've been a hermit my whole life. It was like, ah. So I went to boarding school and college and really never went back. I loved my family, but it was way too formal. But I grew up with all the houses we had were with the beach in the backyard, and I'm a Pisces and I, I'm a light being and I'm a sort of seed. And I've now I think about 128 hybrid children. I've heard I have tons more because my family's on both sides to help start some of the hybridization programs. And there are many. So um, I, I feel very grateful that they picked me. I always say, why me? Why me? Why me? And they just said, because of your family lineage, we trust you. You're good at it. And you have the energy and you love it and you're good at it. And I do love it. And I said, well, it's a bummer because I'm visual and I can't see it. I can't see a lot of this. When you were talking about your family's lineage, I was curious to know what this um, coat of arms or whatever. Well, I'd love you to read it because I'm sure that's that's a Scottish Edwards family. Um, but it, it feels like there's some, it says, nobleized virtuous. I feels like there's some dark stuff in there. <laughs> They've actually been cleaning out some of the... Um, some of the not as nice parts of ancestry that was there. My mom's side was William Bradford who came over on the Mayflower and started America and blah, blah, blah. And dad's family wow. was back too and was kings and queens. And so um, they've really helped clean out because I said, you know, I, I feel pretty normal though, even though I'm weird and I have no memory, but they just said, well, we, we've been helping you. And I, I literally remember them in the womb just going, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So it was fun. It was interesting. I just wasn't able to understand anything, most of it. <laughs> so um, just natural materials. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of these, as we know, are um, 3D models that they're going to use um, that are going to be built on site. Um, yeah, I was reading something earlier today about how they are looking into 3D printing a lot of these materials. Yeah, they are on all a lot of these. And of course, they one of the biggest things is how do they use their water? How do they recycle their urine and everything that's up there there to make it sustainable? And then what about, you know, intense weather? 
Obviously, there's a lot of disaster that we're going to be seeing in the next 50 years. I mean, they say, you know, I was looking today, if, if, if Elon Musk, a friend of mine talked to him, that might work with him a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they were just saying, you know, it's going to, you know, we know we've read that um, he's obviously had a really good year with kickoff, kicking off with the rocket that he had in 2023. And this year he's going to have first uh, will be the first this will be the first of nearly 100 launches for his rocket company this year, which is just insane for the, you know, for the big space wow. companies. And then but he's but um, I've heard from dad up there because he talks to a lot. You know, he's still connected with everybody and my beings because I've been working on this stuff and working on these interiors. So some of just to go back for a minute, some of the habitats inside, say, Venus. All of them, it's you know, sub zero, sub sub her surface. They're cold. It's dark. So we carve out. Um, it's three or four football fields. Some of them. Some of them are twenty miles long, and they, you know, and then we create little Quonset hut type things like that. So this one is like he said. We say it's like mobile home parks. So they showed me an empty cave and said, "What would you do with this, Mary?" So I just say, well, what do you need to do? Are these people living here? Are the beings living here? How many beings are just going to stop by? Some of the closer planets to Earth are, are way places, stopping by. So some of the beings will just come there and hang out. They come for meetings. They come to discuss things. Some of them are living there and working there. Some of them are humans. Some are government. Some are just volunteers that want to go up and be there. A lot of, They have specialties. And then some have six or seven species and some have 25 species. So like the Palladian building that I was working on, I was asking to, to my channel, to, um, I said, well, if, how, if, you, if you're positive and we're positive, how do you eliminate, you know, can you just really reject negative species that, you, that are not benevolent in? And they said, yes, we can. And I said, well, if we're designing, you know, a facility for the 50,000 people we're going to come in and out of, and that's a new building. Um, I said, you know, how much, how many, you know, we were doing bedrooms, even though they don't sleep in beds, we were doing work offices, rest, you know, all the facilities like of any normal building here. My work, daughter works at Salesforce here, which is like the most elegant, beautiful. It's like a space, um, a space habitat. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen or this what space force in San Francisco looks like. I mean, it's, um, Oh, wow. I mean, I didn't know there was a space force. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say space force. I've met Salesforce. I'm sorry. I've been oh. space force today. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Anyway, the, the interiors of a lot of these, um, because of weather winds, extreme winds, obviously really cold weather, a lot of the um, ETs know have such advanced technology. They do a lot of the lighting. What we carve out little simple spaces, like they're the good group of like 12 tier caretakers, four human crew members and Venus when I was there the night we met. I was I, I went that night when I went on the CE5 after I said I want to go up to um, Venus tonight. And oh, so, wow. um, th th you know, they like... Um, they like my style and they, they worked with my family for generations. So they know me, my sisters didn't get that. So, so what is uh, the team of WAC? Hmm? Here is, um, I was just reading here. What, what is the WAC stand for? Oh, the, just not government like wax that just come in. They're not government that just come up that want to work there. I mean, when I'm up there, I'm either in spirit or I look like I'm in human form. So um, I, I, we they bring back me and some of the other guys that um, that we've worked with before on other projects, like I've done here on Earth forever. I've had some of the same teams on a bunch of different projects in China and uh, different companies that I've worked for. So it's all about you know sustainability and being really sustainable, self sufficient, like people we used to be <laughs> in the olden days. Um, that I think, isn't that beautiful? Oh yeah. I was just going to, wow. It's really incredible. It's, it's, it's about oh, these are student energy. designs. Yeah. Isn't that oh, those fun? Mm. I love this. It's about real. What is the lighting in here? I know. Isn't that incredible? I didn't, I didn't have time cause I, you know, I had work other stuff today, so I'm sorry. I didn't get, um, I get, didn't get more of the PowerPoint here. Um, but you know, it's all about, you know, 
I love these little Girl, meditation areas. And the energy and uh, are, isn't that cool? Yeah. It's water and wow. air. It's like what, what we're doing here. It's um, and like what um, I pulled up something. It said 50 year window, 50 year window to establish a space fearing civilization. Now a NASA, a recent NASA report, humankind may only have a short window of 50 years to become a space fearing civilization after which time the opportunity to do so may become too difficult or impractical to pursue. Current policies for space exploration and infrastructure development implicitly assume a gardenistic approach to technology, budgets, and mission ex execution. The common thought has been that there will be plenty of time in humankind's future to begin to become a space-based species. And whatever we are unable to accomplish will be borne by the generations that follow. However, considering natural events, available energy, and human tendencies, the timing to make the most effective effort to achieve multi-planet status might be now, now, before momentum is lost and we become distracted by peak oil and changing energy economies. Restarting a space program after such turmoil might be more difficult then would be practical without cheap storage, high energy density, petroleum, et cetera. Space-faring civilization is defined as an economically profitable space-based economy that demands the presence of humans off-world in order to sustain a high level of prosperity. An initial foothold for a space-based economy would fit within the 50-year window that might include Earth dependence on rare Earth elements or other hard to obtain minerals mined as we know from moons or asteroids or permanent settlement or on another planet. Using published sources, mass and energy requirements for minimal safe building sustaining Mars settlements is calculated and the number for, of launch vehicles discussed. Setting the launch schedule to match that of current NASA projections, it would take more than 26 years of semi-annual launches to build up such a self-sustaining human settlement. So they're saying it'd take 26 years to build a semi-annual launch to be, I mean, to build a self-sustaining human settlement. And that's with NASA. Yeah. This is a new thing from NASA. That I got out of the, um, yeah, today. Was it, is it SpaceX planning on being there this year? Or yes. they're planning on sending out ships this yes, year? Yes, they are planning it. But I did, I'd never heard, I didn't really know what the timeline was. I would not heard that before. A cost and com commitment that has not been acknowledged nor planned for, really. So considering the time required to establish a multi-planet species, this, prop, this paper frames... Um, the re required window of decision that if not taken could condemn the species to earth subject to whatever natural and human made calamities that endanger single planet civilizations. So they're saying if we don't do it more now, because of all the new, the terrible weather that we're going to be getting over the next 20 or 30 or 40 years, well, as we've heard and I was reading more about today too, will really limit that. And that's because of the cycle that the sun is going through, right? That's going exactly. to cause the weather to... And that's what's doing now and why people are getting more cancer and we have to be even more protective of ourselves is the tilt and the, yeah, it's, it's happening quickly as we know too. So I'd love to have a little more time. We just talked about tonight, last night. So I yeah. more research and I did some other things I had to do today. But yeah. Well, um, well we power. we're generating electricity in the future, renewable energy sources, wind power, solar power, we know we what we have to do and we're just not doing it yet. So it's a lot of money and a lot of time and there's a lot of competition and, you know, it's just, it's really too bad, but thank God for Musk and all the, the couple other billionaires and, you know, that are working on it and getting us off planets. It's not the companies anymore. And yeah. you know, in Russia, yeah. and the United States will, will come back, I think, but mostly, um, Musk driving it. Definitely. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think there's a, you know, I, I feel that just, you know, people like me and you, they're coming out and, you know, giving people visual concepts of like what, you know, can be achieved. I think, you know, just getting it more into the collective consciousness is so important right now, because I think the more that people like see visuals of what it is that 
we can achieve together. Like the more people are going to like take up these positions to, um, you know, move things forward, you know, people that have, you know, the resources to do so. Right. So so much of money too, which is right. When I worked on that 30,000 acre hotel development, it was golf courses and stuff in China. I got a sense of what the scope would be like of what the cost is. I mean, I went back, for three or four years with this multi multi billionaire. And then he didn't even really have enough money to really complete a lot of the construction and then COVID happened and now he's back building. But um, it's just, it's, you know, there's hope. We're gonna get the word out and help educate our children more to be aware of sustainability and the need for smarter, happier, healthier environments. Definitely. Well, uh, we've been going on for about an hour now, so I think uh, we should wrap up here. Thank you so much for coming on, Marion. Is there anything you would like to say in closing? And I'll go ahead and bring up your website. Oh, well, thank you. Well, no, I just, it's delight to be with you. You're such a bright star, also on a mission to check it, go into the future. I mean, let's just work together towards more sustainable, happier, healthier lifestyles and future. And let's do a book together. Let's plan some more of these so we can really get people excited and educated a little bit about more about what we have to band together. We have to be the activist to get this going. <laughs> Definitely. I'm, I'm really excited to do some projects with you. Definitely getting the book together right away. And hopefully, um, yeah, conferences coming up here. Conscious Life Expo, by the way, um, anyone watching right now that is um, in the LA area, we will both be at the Conscious Life Expo, and I believe that starts February 10th. Um, I'll have my Shaman Spears booth there with all my brand new collection of Shaman Spears, the Ultraviolet collection. Uh, and if you want to purchase a spear, if you're not able to make it out to the expo on February 10th, you can go to shamanspears.com and check out uh, the new collection there. I do next day shipping on all orders. Um, and so, and then Mary, your website, if anyone wants to contact you. MaryEdwardsDesign.com and my email and everything's on there. So. All right. In the back. Awesome. Well, thank right. you so much for coming on, Mary. And uh, I will go ahead and sign off here. All right. Thank so, you. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone for joining me tonight. And until next time on Apollo's Odyssey, over and out.